Hello everyone and welcome to this week's lecture on juvenile delinquency. In today's lecture, we will be looking at the definition and the nature as well as the extent of juvenile delinquency and juvenile offending. Some gender differences in juvenile offending, that is differences between males and females. How does someone become a juvenile, as in what is the process or what, some, what are some theories that explain the development of juvenile offending? And finally, some of the treatment options available for delinquents. Delinquency can be defined as any behaviour against the criminal code that is committed by an individual who has not yet reached adulthood. The exact definition of reaching adulthood or what actually consists of an adult or what makes you an adult is debatable as it is defined by state or federal law and therefore can vary across countries. Therefore, whether somebody is charged in a juvenile court or in an adult court could also differ across countries and is depending on the country in which he's being tried in. In most countries, however, juveniles are categorized as those who are between the ages of 7 and 12 years old. Someone is considered a juvenile delinquent when they have committed a juvenile act according to the criminal law. Through research, we know that juvenile delinquents are two to three times more likely to become serious, violent and chronic offenders as they grow older. The crimes that they are responsible for may range from petty crimes to more serious crimes such as murder. However, it's also important to note that these crimes are often overrepresented in the media, especially when it involves a young offender committing a violent crime. What this means is that juveniles committing serious crimes doesn't occur as often as what we would think it is based on what we see in the media. One recent case that was highlighted in the media about two years ago um, involved two 12-year-old girls who stabbed another girl 19 times as part of a planned assault. This case got, garnered a lot of media attention for several reasons. Number one, the crime was committed by two 12-year-old girls who were not even teenagers yet. Number two, it was a planned assault in which they had actually planned for the incident or the crime to happen over a period of time. And number three, the so-called perpetrators or criminals in question were females. And usually we don't associate prepubescent females with such crimes. Now you can click on the link on this slide to find out more about this particular incident by watching the video and reading about it. From a psychological perspective, juvenile delinquency is defined or a juvenile delinquent is defined as someone who has been diagnosed with either conduct disorder or antisocial behaviour, whether or not their past crimes or their past incidences are known to the police. In the next section, we will be looking at the nature and extent of juvenile offending locally and elsewhere. This first table is actually based on statistics from the United States um, that were derived from the FBI. As you can see from the table, larceny theft-related offences make up the largest proportion of delinquent arrests in the States. Across all offences, more crimes are committed by those between 15 to 18, year old, 15 to 18 years old compared to younger age. Now that we have looked at some statistics, let's look at some of the key definitions um, that are usually involved in juvenile offending. Usually, the unlawful acts committed by delinquents are categorised into one of these five categories presented on this slide. The first four categories are similar to offences committed by adults. Whereas the fifth category, status offences, is something that is specific to juvenile delinquents. Firstly, the first category, unlawful acts against persons, is defined as the occurrence of violent crimes, which may include things like aggravated assault, robbery or even sexual assault. The second category, unlawful acts against property, involves property crimes such as burglary, larceny, theft and vandalism. And the third category, drug offences, involves the possession, distribution or manufacturing of drugs, 
And the fourth category, which is similar to adults, involves um, the appearance or the occurrence of nuisance crimes against society, such as noise violations. As I mentioned earlier, the fifth category is something that's only applicable to juveniles, and this is what we term as status offences. These are acts that only juveniles can be charged for committing, and they may include violation of curfew, running away, as well as school truancy. Status offences, as I mentioned earlier, are offences that can only be applied to a certain group of people, usually minors, and these offences are not adjudicated by uh, adult court, but, are, but instead come under the charge of juvenile courts. The most common status offences are running away and underage drinking. There is a gender difference here where girls are more likely to be arrested for status offences as the same behaviours are likely to be ignored or accepted when boys commit them because they often people brush it off saying, oh well, boys will be boys. The majority of juvenile delinquents are not involved in serious crimes. And serious delinquents, that is delinquents who consistently offend, or who are involved in more vicious or violent crimes actually only make up a very small percentage of adolescent criminals. However, it is believed that these incidences are underestimated by official arrest data as many of them remain free and are not arrested or not charged in court. Those involved in serious delinquent behaviours usually have a high recidivism rate when they are young and these recidivism rates are likely to continue even as they grow older. They also are likely to be involved in committing a wide variety of offences. These offences could include theft, minor property crimes and violent crimes. They also usually exhibit behave such behaviours from an early age. Fortunately, not all of them continue to offend as adults and many of them actually reduce their offending behaviours as they grow older. This is something that we will look at as we examine some of the development or uh, some of the psychological theories that us understand the development of delinquent behaviours in more detail. Uh, this slide gives us some information on the number of juveniles that have been arrested in Singapore over the years. As you can see, it seems to be declining, um, not by a lot, but by, by at least 100, every, 100 to 200 arrests every year. However, if you think about it, the arrest of 1,323 people, such as those who were arrested in 2013, is actually quite, still quite a lot. It means there are about four juvenile delinquents arrested every year. Beyond parental control, or BPC, is a term accorded to a child or young person who is below the age of 16 years who may be in persistent conflict with his or her parents or parents and school or other authorities. 
this young person usually also displays other at-risk behaviours for deviancy. Usually, there is also a breakdown in the relationship and communication between the child or young person and his or her parent or guardian. This results in the parent or guardian being unable to exercise care and control over the child or young person. In such cases, the parent or guardian has the option to apply to the juvenile or children care court for beyond parental control order. What this means then is that the legal guardianship of the child is taken away from the parent or guardian and the child is placed under the care of the Ministry of Community Child and Youth, sorry, Ministry of Community, Culture and Youth or MCCY. As you can see from this slide, the total number of new BPC cases has generally been on a downward trend since 2008. Um, if you compare the total number of cases from 2008 to 2012, for example, there is a drop of almost 50%. The drop in the number is probably not due to less cases being reported, but more likely due to a change in the system where more cases are diverted to pre-court diversionary programs where the child and their guardian are required to go through mandatory counselling programs, family sessions to actually help them resolve the issue so the child can continue li living with their parents. In this next section, we will look at some of the key gender differences that exist in juvenile offending. Traditionally, more boys compared to girls are involved in juvenile delinquency. This is similar to a trend. This is similar to the trend evident among adults. This gender difference could be due to social learning factors where girls are socialized differently and are taught to be different. However, this gender gap seems to be closing, especially for certain crimes, such as sex in public crimes. This suggests that the socialization process between boys and girls may be a little bit more comparable. For example, girls now also receive messages that it's okay to be assertive and to say no when they do not want to do something. Um, however, these findings need to be validated as most research with juvenile delinquents still focus on boys and not girls, probably due to the big gender gap between the two genders. Some of the research on juvenile delinquents and why they get involved in this crime are less likely to be involved in instances that involve peer violence. And usually this peer violence is perceived to be in reaction to an offence or harassment against them, and the delinquency is self-defence against these like harassment, as their social sort of standing, or they see their behaviours as necessary to actually defend their sexual reputation. They are also likely to be involved in school violence. This school violence is seen as an expression of anger against the teachers, or as a reaction to their feelings of hopelessness. In more violent neighbourhoods, um, their delinquency may also be their way of defending themselves against abuse or other forms of danger. Sometimes, females and girls who are involved in or secret societies where violent behaviour is expected of them. Finally, within a family setting, female delinquents usually resort to violence to fight back against perceived over controlling parenting styles or sibling rivalry. More seriously, it could also be a reaction against physical, emotional, or sexual abuse that they suffer from at home. In this next section, we're going to look at how to explain the development of the child, or at least attempt to explain the development. Two of the main theories that try to explain the development of the is um, morphic development theory as well as the coercion development theory. The first one that we will look at is morphic development theory. Morphic proposes that there are actually two types of juvenile delinquents. You've got the life force persistent offender 
and the adolescent inter um, This theory is one of the integrated roles of juvenile delinquency that attempts to bridge the ideological differences that exist among various modern theories of juvenile delinquency by integrating various theoretical approaches. Um, this approach, as well as the approach of development theory that we will look at later, recognizes that crime is a complex multidimensional phenomenon with multiple causes. It is not something that we can understand um, easily by just using one approach. Moffitt proposes that life caused by persistent offenders begin displaying antisocial behaviors in childhood, and these behaviors continue to worsen thereafter. Whereas adolescent mental offenders start um, developing and showing antisocial behaviors in adolescence, and these behaviors desist or stop during adulthood. He suggests that life caused persistent antisocial are poor, however, their behaviors are more persistent and pathological whereas adolescent limited offenders are more common. However, their behaviors are temporary and less extreme. This theory argues that life cause persistent offenders start um, displaying such behaviors early, sometimes as early as three or four years old, and often the difficult behavior of a high-risk young child is worsened by, by the fact that According to this theory, the child's risk emerges from inherited or um, genetic factors which are initially manifested through subtle cognitive deficits that make it harder for them to perform well in school, for example. And they may also um, display some neurological issues such as ADHD and other mental As a result, they often don't do well in school. Um, and they have poor interpersonal and social skills. Um, often, as I mentioned earlier, these factors are worsened by environmental risk factors, which may include things like inadequate parenting, disrupted family bonds, and mobility. Often, the environmental risk expands beyond the family because. Um, the child also interacts with an environment that is not conducive, that does not help him develop pro social life skills. Morphic argues that the personality characteristics associated with life force persistent offenders, such as aggression, may therefore be more adaptive for them. As such, he says that, um, sorry, he argues that the personality characteristics associated with life force persistent offenders, such as aggression, may actually meet the adaptive form of behavior, especially for males. As such, more males than females possess such personality characteristics, which then of course also puts them at greater risk compared to females with serious problems behaviors at a later age. In contrast, adolescent limited offenders start displaying delinquent behaviors uh, during puberty and otherwise um, they have pro-social and healthy lifestyle until then. Um, the display of these behaviors may be due to gaps between their biological information as in their ability to process information and make logical safe decisions as compared to their access to mature privileges and responsibilities. When they are in this period, it is normal for them to find um, a more delinquent lifestyle appealing because it is cooler, they may find it fun, and therefore they may want to mimic this lifestyle as a way for them to demonstrate their autonomy from their parents, win affiliation for peers, and perhaps to access what they wouldn't be able to access if they were so-called good adolescents. Um, usually, these offenders are normal. They do not have neurological problems such as learning difficulties. They have above-average academic, personal, and social skills as well. 
As a result of this, they often also have poor social skills that allow them to integrate and succeed within the confines of expectations of society. And because of this, most young people who become adolescent, adolescent limited offenders are able to resist from crime once they reach adulthood. And then they choose to turn to a more conventional lifestyle that is also usually more pro-social in nature. However, their ability to resist may be deterred um, if they have a criminal record or incarcerated or become addicted to drugs during that period of them being an adolescent limited offender. While this theory helps us understand many different aspects of delinquent behaviours, it is not without its criticism. One of the main criticisms of Moffitt's developmental theory is that it was developed primarily with male delinquents. Um, therefore, it may be more applicable to males than it is to females. Moffitt's developmental theory also suggests that there are some gender differences between males and females, where males are more likely to be life cause persistent offenders and females more likely to be adolescent limited offenders. Um, it also suggests that adolescent female offenders who are adolescent limited by nature are more likely to be involved in delinquent behaviours as a result of getting into an intimate relationship with a male delinquent. Finally, another gender difference that has emerged from this theory is that antisocial behaviours in girls may be delayed, that is, they may only come to surface during their adolescent years due to um, social norms that restrict outward aggressive tendencies in girls from a very young age. A second integrated theory attempts to explain the development of juvenile delinquency is the coercion development theory. Um, the goal of coercion development theory is to ascertain the developmental origins and social conditions that can help to explain between individual variation in juvenile delinquent behaviours. It provides a developmental perspective in understanding delinquent behaviours and it supports the idea that many different do influence the development of adolescent behavior. Um, specifically, it looks at the parental influence on adolescent behavior. According to coercion theory, whether an individual engages in deviant behaviors as a child or an adolescent on um, the interaction and relationship between the parent and child. Yeah, coercion is defined by the person who the needs to be enforcement of an activity behavior, and the coercion process is a series of feedback loops that escalate over time. The propose that those who display coercive behaviors from a very early age are at greater risk for serious offending. They also propose that family and the family environment is a key predictor of early onset delinquency. Um, especially when coercive behaviours are used to escape parental discipline. Let me give you an example. When a parent tries to discipline his or her child, the child responds in an aversive manner. This could be through whining, crying, or throwing a temper. Unable to control the reaction, the child's reaction, the parent returns with an escalated attempt at disciplining the child. For example, by increasing the intensity of scolding or threatening the child. However, the child in return um, escalates his coercive behaviour instead of giving in to the parent. This process continues until the parent desists in trying to discipline the child. As time goes on, the parent terminates discipline attempts, the first sign of the child engaging in aversive behaviour. Eventually, the parent ignores aversive behaviours altogether, allowing the child to get away with both initial inappropriate and aversive behaviours. The coercive behaviours are further elicited, maintained and exacerbated through the process of reinforcement each time the sequence of behaviour occurs. For example, positive reinforcement occurs if the parent provides a skill to, to which the child responds aversively. In this case, the parent's attempt to discipline is the child's cue to start engaging in aversive behaviours. 
Negative reinforcement, on the other hand, occurs when the parent desists in the discipline of ten in the face of the child's aversive response. That is, the parent stops disciplining the child when the child starts to in a temper. In essence, because of the ineffective parenting, the child learns that it is okay to engage in aversive behaviors to get their way. Um, this pattern of conditioning is then generalized to other areas of their lives. Now, we do need to take note of two things. Firstly, some level of coercion occurs within every family. However, not all children who engage in the coercion process um, are at high risk for delinquency. Second, when the child is young, he or she engages in overt aversive behaviours, including crying and going to the temple. However, most children learn to desist from these behaviours as they grow older. A small group of children, however, may take these aversive behaviours to the next level, where the crying and throwing tem temper tantrums change from overt to covert behaviours that are more serious, for example, the use of contact, vandalism, drugs. Therefore, the coercion development different shapes between early onset phase and later stars. Um, they propose that both understand their nature and the same processes, that is, social and environmental influences such as divorce, poverty, parental oppression, work in combination with the app parity and European peer socialization, and this in turn results in delinquent behaviors and antisocial behaviors. Those who display early onset delinquency or early onset coercive behaviors usually start displaying these behaviors in their preschool years, as young as three or four years old. And in such cases, um, in that parenting is more severe, and this results in those who start displaying delinquent behaviors at a later age usually start displaying these behaviors in middle adolescence. And usually, it is not so much a result of inept parenting, but more a result of um, mixing with delinquent peers. In this final section, we will look at people to help delinquent or juvenile delinquents get back in the In general, um, type of pro prevention programs. The first of primary prevention programs, also known as universal prevention programs. These, these programs actually target a large group of children before any signs of behavior emerge. Um, usually, these training interventions start before the class at seven years old. And their focus is more general, where the focus is to reduce risk factors and increase protective factors. This, for example, could be helping children become more resilient helping children um, develop more pro-social skills, educating parents as well. The second category is known as secondary prevention, where they target selected groups of children, and usually these are children who have already been displaying early signs of antisocial behavior. The advantage of this type of um, intervention program is that it deploys the resources to those who need it sense that these children have already been identified for high risk. The danger here, however, is that we start labelling children from a very young age. Some of the characteristics of successful programs are listed in the next slide. We know that successful programs start early, where antisocial children should be identified from as young as four or five years old, and training should definitely start before they're eight years old. The training program should follow um, sound and curriculum based developmental principles, which are based on risk and protective factors. And this is especially important when the child lives in a more dangerous or high risk environment. Um, successful programs should also focus on multiple systems and settings. That is, they should use a multi pronged approach and not just focus on the child alone, but also look at the larger context within which the child lives in. This could include their family, 
the social environment as well as the school environment. We also know that health education for pregnant women is very important to prevent biological or biologically related factors um, to delinquency. For example, pregnant women should be educated on the dangers of head injuries to babies, why they shouldn't be exposed to toxins such as um, nicotine, alcohol and drugs when they're pregnant, as well as the importance of proper nutrition when they're pregnant and when the child is young. Um, in a multicultural setting, it is also important for programs to acknowledge and respect the cultural backgrounds that the child lives in. Um, the most successful programs actually work within these cultural factors to promote the more positive aspects of the family cultural background. And finally, the most successful programs should focus on the family first, and schools and peers are secondary, in the sense that if they can help the child operate functionally within the family, help the parents develop more social skills and better parenting styles, that actually has a much more positive impact than just focusing on um, developing friendships or doing well in school. Having said that, it doesn't mean that doing well in school and having good friendships or pro-social support is not important. Um, treatment options can also be categorized in a different way, where they can be categorized as traditional residential treatments and non-traditional residential. Let's look at the traditional residential treatment first. Um, traditional residential treatment programs are programs where juvenile delinquents are housed in physically secure facilities. For example, in Singapore, it could be the boys' home or the girls' home or the recommended training centres. Boys' and girls' homes come under the jurisdiction of the Ministry of Culture, Community and Youth, and CCY, whereas the recommended training centres are for most serious delinquents and they come under the Ministry of Home Affairs. Um, research suggests that the results long-term from housing um, juvenile delinquents in these traditional residential treatment facilities are not very encouraging. Um, often, um, delinquents who come out from these programs continue to abuse substances. They may actually even have, suffer from more emotional disturbance as a result of the incarceration and they do not achieve much academically. However, if this traditional residential treatment doesn't just involve locking up the patient, but also um, is supplemented by other forms of treatment, such as social skills training, family therapy, academic programs, or vocational skills programs, they can be successful. More recently, non-traditional residential treatments have been proposed. Um, these are usually boot camp style treatments, which are very short term, intensive, where um, they have a very, very regimented approach to training and discipline. Um, in the short run, these programs appear to be more successful, where delinquents who graduate from these programs tend to be more focused on their education. Um, they put a lot of emphasis on physical fitness, and there is an increase in respect. They have for authority figures. Unfortunately, however, this is not long. The HR, I'd actually like to direct you. Um, deal with my help. Thank you.